Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This time we're gonna be talking about building pieces for Warriors of the Dark Gods. Uh, what I mean with this is basically setups for units and, and characters and stuff uh, that you can include in your list uh, and then, well, basically stuff that I think is, is good to just include in, in nearly any list. Uh, some of these also lead to other setups for the rest of your list um, and then in that way, they kind of dictate um, how your list evolves. Let's just first look at some, some random stuff that you can include in your list, which I think is, is quite good. Obviously, we have the, the Rocket Man. Um, so this is a Chosen Lord with Wrath, with the Spiked Shield, with Dusk Forged. Trice Forged, and the Symbol of Slaughter, and Demonic Wings. Um, so this setup, what does it give you? It gives you a Chosen Lord uh, who can fly, so he has Swift Stride with Advance 8, I believe. Um, you can also put him in a unit with a banner of speed so that he goes to uh, Advance even higher. Um, so he's quite a mobile piece. What he brings to the table basically is a 1-up rerollable armor save um, with a spiked shield, so every 4 plus that you manage to uh, to save an armor save on, you're going to do a hit back onto the attacker at strength 5 with AP2. Um, so it's it's really a tin can, um, and then in addition to that, he still strikes. <laughs> so why Wrath? Because, well, actually just because the opponent gets plus 1 to hit against you, so you get more hits. Um, and then why would you want Symbol of Slaughter? Uh, because once again, you get more hits on your model. And it combines pretty well with a spiked shield uh, because it actually gives you a bonus rather than um, a lot of the other items that you could go for. Uh, I think Symbol of Slaughter goes pretty well here because it also boosts your agility even further. Together with Wrath, I think you're going to end up at agility 9 or 10 even. Um, so you are going to be striking first most of the times at least. Uh, I believe with 7 attacks, um, strength 5, which is not bad at all. And then you are going to benefit uh, from all the hits that you're going to do back based on the armor save that you save. Uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty nifty piece. Um, what you do need in your list is some other stuff that uh, is also going to go out on its own. Usually Warriors of the Dark Gods is quite good at that. Um, but just in order to distract the enemy uh, skewers or bolt throwers from targeting your Chosen Lord, um, it would be good to, to have some distractions. Uh, second on my list is the single ratchet one. Uh, I don't believe a lot of people play this, uh, but I think it's a really good anti-chaff piece in Warriors of the Dark Gods. Um, so the opponent will bring chaff uh, more likely than not. Um, and usually with Warriors of the Dark Gods, it's quite easy to overspend on units um, to get them to a point where they're really killy and really efficient. You don't have to, um, and I think uh, a single ratchet one is a very good way of getting rid of enemy chaff and um, while your opponent has to do something about it um, it's 75 points it's unbreakable it's resilience four with three wounds and a five for regen save so sure your opponent can also get rid of it by shooting it or by uh, casting a spell on it but then again it's 75 points it's a, you, you're not really going to care um, and it doesn't yeah, you, you don't suffer from it when you lose it in your list. In addition, it is always in combat going to do D6 plus 1 strength 4 hits, and a lot of fast cavalry units actually don't really like that. Um, so it's a pretty reliable way of getting rid of chaff, in my opinion. Uh, and the random move means that your opponent really has to respect all of the distance around uh, your wretched one. Then we go to the Barbarian Chief. Um, I think the best way to field him at the moment is on a Shadow Chaser uh, with Trice Forged, uh, Heavy Armor, and Bad Weapon Shield Breaker. So the Barbarian Chief benefits from the fact that he's a cheap hero and already has Strength 5. Um, strength 5 is enough to get you to the ballpark where you don't really need a Strength Boost for your Chief, uh, for your hero. Um, and when Shield Breaker becomes quite attractive, because you're going to wound a lot of stuff on, on 3 plus anyway in terms of stuff that has a good armor save. And AP6 is is really a lot. It's really a tool to get through stuff that um, you would otherwise struggle with. And the Shadow Chaser is quite invaluable, I find, because of the Vanguard 6 inches. 
Uh, it's one of the few things in the Warriors of the Dark Gods book that can actually vanguard, um, even though it's just a little bit, um, and then threaten quite far. But you still have four strength five attacks, which is not bad combined with a one up armor save. Sure, it's 295 points in one model. Um, compared to some other choices in the book, it's a bit pricey for the output that you get. However, being able to just march 20 inches and having uh, this vanguard. So being able to run into the deployment zone of the opposing team in turn one, that is quite advantageous, I would say. Uh, then the last bit I put here is just to get a very efficient magic phase um, for not that many points. It's something that I appreciate and I find that a lot of people don't really appreciate. Um, it's just to run stuff in a cheap way. I mean, if you want just a minimal magic phase, you can field two sorcerers, uh, two sorcerers, <laughs> two units of 15 barbarians, both with a musician. Then you have your scoring covered. You have a gigantic health pool for your sorcerer to be safe. Um, and yeah, magic phase is not that bad if you have two alchemy spells and two avocation spells. Um, so. If you invest 800 points, you have two scoring units, uh, out of which 300 points comes from core. You have uh, 450 points that you spend on magic. Uh, you can also use this setup only once to just um, um, to to add on to your pre-existing magic or elsewhere in your list. Uh, but I think it's quite a decent uh, a decent unit. Um, with alchemy and with avocation especially, you're not going to look for situations where you have to be close to the enemy. Um, avocation boosts your own troops, uh, alchemy as well. Sure, with glory of gold, you would like to uh, uh, to boost um, your attacks by also making your opponent flammable, so you have to be within 18 inches, so it's a bit more restrictive. However, fitting in 15 barbarians with a sorcerer somewhere in the back lines uh, within 18 inches of your enemy, that's uh, once you need it, it's, it's going to be quite manageable to do. So that is uh, also a piece that I think is often overlooked by people um, because, well, being scoring is quite viable for the barbarians, so I would prefer them over Fallen. Uh, then we go to the Helmor. Um, well, the Helmor, I find, brings quite a lot of considerations into your list. Uh, obviously, there's, there's also some videos by Alexander Schmidt who um, talked about the Helmor and whether to go for two Helmors, one Helmor with two portals, one Helmor with one portal. Um, I usually tend to go for a Helmor with one portal, even though my lists often start out with a Helmor without any portals. Um, but that's also because I regard the Helmor as an extra option if you play against the lists that you could otherwise not beat with your Warriors. Uh, so, for example, a very heavily defended gun line where you really have to go over the flanks. Um, so with a Helmor you can just wait a couple of turns and then, um, well, you have put down your tokens. Uh, you can just hide behind some terrain for the first couple of turns. And then uh, that's going to be fine. However, having one gateway really helps on the Helmor, So I would actually advise to, in most situations, just take one gateway on him. Uh, what kind of pieces do work quite well with Elmo? Well, generally stuff that can charge rather far, um, because otherwise if you go out of your portal you cannot charge anything because everything just moves away. So if you play Warriors, uh, I would always play them with Envy um, if you play a Helmo. Uh, so you get Swift Stride. And then uh, Warrior Knights combine quite good with a Helmo. Um, and that is my way of playing mostly with a Helmo. Uh, the other way to play is to play with two gateways and just teleport something first turn in face <laughs> in front of your opponent. Something like 30 warriors with halberds or something. Um, just turn one, bam. There you go. What are you going to do about it? Uh, that's another way to play it. Um, I think in the end it's a bit of a one-trick pony, so it's less flexible in that sense. Uh, what I also looked into is to use a battle shrine. Um, I see that on the slide it doesn't mention that the sorcerer here is on a battle shrine. Uh, but these should be on a battle shrine. Um, and then I thought about what you want to have as a unit actually for the battle shrine. And I thought that actually chosen are quite funny for this. Uh, so a unit of six chosen comes in at like 400 points depending on whether you take pride or sloth. 
I think personally I would go for Pride because of the minimized discipline. Um, and people always say like you shouldn't plan for losing combats, but it's also a way to lure opponents in. Uh, because with Pride, with minimized discipline, you're not going to go anywhere basically. Uh, you really have to lose a combat very badly to not stick around on a rerollable minimized discipline 9. Um, Sloth obviously puts your uh, Chosen at the same level in terms of defenses um, their resilience as the Battle Shrine. Um, and then the Sorcerer as Parry, the unit as Parry. You're actually not going to do that much damage to this unit with the Battle Shrine and the Chosen, whilst the Chosen still have an output of 19 Strength 4 attacks at Offensive 6, which is quite a decent output for just any unit. Uh, and then you still have the output of the Battle Shrine. Um, I think it's uh, it's quite a cool combination. Uh, um, well, then the question still remains, why does this combine well with a Helmo? Uh, well, you have a Wizard Master on Occultism. Uh, they usually suffer from range. Um, if you have a unit that is not even that big in terms of footprint, and you can teleport it through a Helmo, you can get to places where uh, opponents would struggle to get. And you can just start blasting with your occultism without having to take the extra range from Velvalker. So you can actually go for the reroll on the armor saves or the reroll to wound. Um, so imagine doing a pentagram of pain in the middle of the enemy lines uh, with either extra range or with a reroll to wound or reroll armor saves. Or obviously the grave calls, hellfire, and just you name it. There's uh, quite a lot of opportunity there. Um, and whilst we're on the topic of Helmos, I would also advocate for the use of chariots. Um, most importantly, lust chariots, actually. I used to run a list with two, two chosen lords on lust chariots, and I thought this was great. Um, obviously, there's also the alternative of using a chosen chariot with lust. And then, um, then basically you get the same damage output, more or less, as the chosen lords. The only thing that you miss is a 4-up Aegis or a 4-up uh, regeneration save. Um, yeah, whether it's worth it or not really depends on what you face on the other side of the table. If there's something that uh, just ignores your armor, basically, uh, but doesn't ignore your Aegis or your regen, then it makes a difference. Otherwise, the Chosen Lords get quite expensive quite quickly. And obviously, the Chosen Lords also stick around a bit better with Discipline 9 instead of Discipline 8. I don't know why Chosen Chariots have Discipline 8. Um... So what is funny about having Lust on a Chariot in a Helmor list is, well, first of all, you have Lust, so you have Strider. So your Chariot does not have to take any dangerous terrain tests during the game at any point. Um, second of all, if you have Lust, you will always still have the option to flee. And, well, Chosen Lords being caught out in the open by a unit that really wants to charge them is a bit of a problem. Um, so... Having an option to still flee away is quite fun, actually. Now, the really fun thing comes when you plan out your move after your flee. Uh, so you, ex you can put your Chosen Lord in a situation where you can pressure the opponent to such an extent that he cannot let you not do anything. Uh, but then you can also just flee away, obviously. Uh, so you can put him in a spot where it's possible for you to flee. Then with minimized discipline, you're going to rally. You're not going to be shaken. Uh, so you are able to move. You can move onto a Helmor token and you can teleport um, wherever you want, basically. So what I did before a couple of times already is that you set up this situation where the opponent really has to charge your Chosen Lord. Because otherwise, uh, shit's going to go down. Um, so you flee. Uh, you flee away. Uh, you rally. You move onto the token and you... Teleport to a location to threaten the unit that just had a field charge against your Chosen Lord. Um, so basically you win a turn in this way. And that is quite strong on a last chariot. Uh, so in terms of setup, uh, one of them has a lance with blast inscriptions to get some grinding power. The other has paired weapons with Kingslayer to be able to, to uh, grind through enemy characters. Um, you can set them up a bit differently if you want, but I would advocate for use of the Talisman of Shielding with Luck of the Dark Gods on one character and Death Cheater on the other. 
Um, you can still make them a bit more flame resistant, alchemy resistant with uh, either uh, magic resistance or basalt infusion or uh, dragonfire gem, which is always a good choice because these pieces get quite expensive. Um, but yeah, that's that's going to be it for this video. Uh, I hope you learned something <laughs> in terms of list building. Um, and I might do some more videos like this uh, in the future. Thank you for watching.